And joining us here now on In the Circle, she is, uh, believe it or not, I can't believe it, her fourth season as head coach at UNLV, has helped her turn the program, had three winning seasons. They haven't had a winning season since 2011 prior to her arrival. And, of course, she a, was a first-team All-American in 2005, 2006 at Arizona, two-time national champion. I speak of Christy Fox, who's back with us here on In the Circle. How you doing? I'm doing well. Can you just follow me around and give me that entrance every time I walk in a room? I love it. I'm all for it. I, I'm, I'm here for you. The, the check, as long as the check clears, right? Um, yeah. How are you? What's it been like for you, obviously, in your program with everybody that we're all dealing with, uh, for you in the fall here now getting set to start a 2021 season after really a 2020 season that was so promising for you, 21 and 5, uh, got cut short, obviously. What has it been like for you? Yeah, I mean, we were lucky. We were able to have some practice time um, this fall. Um, our school decided to tier, so sp some sports were going and then other sports were going. So we kind of were in that second tier, which started us a little bit later, but we absolutely positively needed it. Over half of our team were newcomers. So we had 10 um, newcomers that joined our program. And as anybody knows, that first semester is just so important to integrate those players into, to, into your team. And it was definitely a struggle just with everything that we have going on um, in the world right now with this pandemic um, and our student athletes being isolated and just that transition into the dorm and, and away from your family in the first place is very difficult. And it was probably um, the hardest that I've ever seen a, a freshman class be hit. So, you know, it was really tough for them. And with the COVID procedures and us trying to separate the team and make sure that we limited contact as much as possible and really protect their health, it took a big hit on um, all of our players' mental health. So I'm really excited to get them back now um, where we actually have some games in front of us to really start working on the softball side because the fall was really about just trying to be together and their mental health. And that's the uniqueness, you, you're, that momentum you had in 2020. Can you bring that over to 2021? Do you have to start over? Can it be a little bit of a mix? Because I know you got new faces on your team, but you have a good core that has now built this winning tradition that you've built, started here at UNLV. I've mentioned you've had winning seasons every year since you've arrived. UNLV pro prior to your arrival hadn't had a winning season since 2011. How do you keep that momentum and taking it to the next level uh, even with new faces and maybe even some familiar faces coming back. Yeah, I think that the good thing about UNLV right now is that the core of our program, like you said, is coming back. We have very strong pitching that came back. Um, our defense, which is pretty much, you know, our pride. Uh, most of them are coming back. We had we have three super seniors that are coming back to help the program using that waiver year. Um, so really the freshmen are going to be complimentary. We have some that are very, very um, bright and can potentially be really big difference makers for us. Um, we just got to come back and, and work hard in this spring segment. I think we have a couple spots still up for grabs, you know, that competition piece within the team. Um, so I think that we have a really good and strong core really good leadership um, and, and some players that have really kind of set the tone for this program. So as far as that goes, I think that the biggest piece for us is going to be trying to integrate them and create that chemistry because this fall based on COVID and, and the game plan just to keep ourselves healthy didn't allow for it. So we got to fast track that team chemistry here this next month. You mentioned your pitching and returning Jenny Bresler. Uh, has been your ace. Uh, what has she looked like to you? What has she meant to you? Uh, she was having another incredible season, 11 and 3 in 2020 and 13 starts, a 127 ERA. She's been an all conference performer, all region performer. Uh, and here she is entering her junior season. Uh, what has she meant? And then the rest of your staff behind her. Yeah, I think she's been a huge impact player for us. Um, she's one of those ones that I don't necessarily have to worry about. She really takes her craft seriously. So she knows what she's trying to do. She knows what she wants to do and she knows what she needs to do to get better. So as far as pitching goes and someone that's going home to Michigan and doing things on their own, she's one of those ones that I absolutely trust to know that she's going to be coming back ready to go. I think the key for her is you continue to face the same people over and over, especially once you get into conference, is how do you become um, deceiving on that second game? 
You know what I mean? So those players are going to start seeing her uh, more and more often. And so the first game, that's the, that's the one they haven't seen you in a while, but it's that second game. How are you going to be deceiving to those hitters to really have that great impact? Um, but I know Jenny's working hard and she's going to come back prepared and, you know, we're going to have a good game plan for her. Um, as far as the, re the rest of the staff, you know, we brought Charlie Masterson back as well. Um, she's a good power pitcher with a good off speed. Um, she's always done well for us and provided a lot of inning support for Jenny. So we're excited to have her back. And then we have some newcomers, some freshmen, um, right-handed pitcher uh, Jenna Perez, Jasmine Martin, who's local from Las Vegas, and a left-handed pitcher in Kaylee Northrup. I think the beauty about them is they still have some work to do um, and really kind of transitioning into the college game, but they're all different. And when you have a staff, you definitely want to have different looks for the hitter. So all three of them are very different. I think the key for them is to help them build confidence early on and making sure as we as a coaching staff put them in situations where they can be successful and be ready to uh, make a change or make a move at the right time. You know, Jenny's one of those ones where she every once in a while is going to get herself in trouble, same with Charlie, and we're going to keep them out there and they're going to need to figure it out. Um, these freshmen, I think we really need to be prepared to make adjustments and, you know, maybe they're only seeing the hitters two times through the lineup and then we're going to make a change. So I think as a coaching staff, we have a little bit of a challenge in front of us making sure that we're ready to go on that um, this spring. No doubt. And, you know, since you've been arriving there, your pitching staff has been among the best in the Mountain West. You're below three ERA. I mean, prior to your arrival, I think the last time UNLV as a team had an ERA in the threes or lower was in the 90s. Uh, which is kind of wild to think about. What, how have you been able to kind of have success in the pitching department? Because everybody that follows the Mountain West, obviously the ball flies in a lot of these different places. So it's a very offensive-friendly conference, but yet you've had success in pitching. Obviously talent is a big part of that with Jenny and all this, the arms you've had. But what, how have you been able to be successful and, and adapt there from a pitching standpoint? Yeah, I mean, we've had two great uh, pitching coaches since I've been here, T Tina Andriana, who's now a head coach, and then Emily Vincent. I think that they do a really good job. They connected with our players, right? And instead of trying to have a cookie cutter program in our pitching staff, we really try to get them to be the best version of themselves. How are you going to be the best? We're going to take your strengths and get them better and help you with your weaknesses, but we're not going to change what you've been doing your entire life. I think when you really work hard on that and focus on that, your student athletes and your pitchers, the pitchers um, specifically, they buy in and then have confidence, right? Our game is so much about confidence and giving them confidence and having them have that confidence on the mound. Um, so I think that our game plan and really trying to build off of um, their own strengths and support them and build confidence. I think that's kind of why you see um, maybe they're, they're not the most talented. Maybe, you know, they don't always have the best game. But at the end of the day, they have confidence in themselves and their teammates have confidence in them and their staff has confidence in them. And, and that goes a really long way. Who are your leaders on the offensive side? Um, well, we have a super senior who came back, um, Justine. Uh, she's our second baseman. She's an absolutely stud second baseman. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think it looking at her, but she is um, an offensive juggernaut for us. She, she's got a lot of power. She, we need her to hit a lot of RBIs. And then Mia Trejo, our first baseman, who's had a lot of success, first team all conference, um, lots of good numbers for us. Um, she's another one. We really need her to produce and, and have a good year. Those two have always kind of done really well. They're definitely the leaders offensively. We added some speed. The Mountain West really didn't get to see it because we didn't play them, but we have a freshman um, left-handed slapper, who I guess we're going to call a sophomore this year. Um, our left fielder, Maddie, she, she did a great job offensively for us. And we have a super senior, our center fielder, um, LT, who came from junior college. Um, she's going into her third season based on the super senior and she had a really great year as well. So we have a good balance of some speed and some power. Um, we have a couple people who I think are just kind of on the brink of really finding themselves at the plate in our, our shortstop, Sam Diaz. I think if she has a good, strong offensive year, that's going to be really big for us as well. So um, offensively, you know, we have a good balance to try to manufacture some. We don't have to just live on the home run. Um, you know, steal some bases, put ourselves in some good situations, hit and run, try to make some things happen. You know, when you're playing the same team over and over again, sometimes you got to do that. 
We're speaking with UNLV head coach Christy Fox here on In the Circle and, of course, two-time national champion, All-American. And recently you were uh, part of the – Arizona did, the, of course, this big long feature in the offseason where they did their all-decade teams, kind of celebrating each decade with Coach Candrea. You were a part of that for the uh, all-decade team in the 2000s. Now, we had, obviously – Taryn Moad and Caitlin Lowe, I talked to them, and I joked with them, like, the team, the 2000 team is, is the coach's decade there. I mean, you're in coaching, they're in coaching, and, like, first of all, because uh, I know you took part of that. They had a big Zoom uh, reunion with Coach Kendra and all the players from the decade, which I thought was cool. Uh, people could check that out on YouTube. What did, uh, what did it mean to you when you found out you were honored there, part of the all-decade team, and, and, you, and participating in, in that? Yeah, it was awesome. And to be listed as a shortstop with the amount of shortstop that the shortstops that have come through that program, um, that meant a lot to me. I mean, if you look at that team, there are so many just great athletes and, and some of the ones that I've really looked up to um, prior to getting to Arizona. So, I mean, I was just really honored. And then I was really excited that my sister was listed on, on the next decade team as a shortstop as well. So I just think that that was really cool. I love how Arizona really incorporates their tradition and they always go back to the people that came before them. I think that the effort they make and that Coach Andrea makes and, and their SID makes to um, you know, show the people that came before and really educate the players there um, about those girls and about the legacy and about the previous national championship teams. I just think that that's something really special that Arizona does a really great job on. What was it like reu reuniting with, I don't know how many of the, the players on the decade did you know? Obviously, you played with many of them, including Taryn and Caitlin, part of those national championship teams. But I'm sure there were some there that you got to meet a little bit. What was that like to be part of that reunion there? And then have you been trash talking with your sister uh, as far as who's got the better all-decade team? Me and my sister always trash talk. But we don't <laughs> trash talk about the other players as much as we trash talk about who was a better Smart. player and who was a better shortstop. So we always do that. Um, you know what? I played with, I would say about 90% of that team um, that's listed there, whether they were a little older or a little younger than me. And then all the other girls I've known, I think that, you know, the alumni always came back and supported us and would visit and introduce themselves. And so all of those players, I mean, I knew every single one of them, um, when we were on that Zoom. And I think that that's something that's special with Arizona is just how they make across the board people connect. Um, so yeah, I knew all of them. It was such a fun time. I think as I get older, I get more and more comfortable teasing Coach Candrea. Um, and as you can <laughs> see, I'm a coach and I still call him Coach Candrea, you know? So I don't think I'm ever going to get to the point where I'm going to be like, hey, Mike, how's things going? So I, I get more and more comfortable as I get older, kind of jabbing them a little bit and, and, and doing some jokes, which you can see if you go and look at that YouTube of that. Yeah, what, that was so amazing. And you could tell the big smile on his face. Uh, it was, I, I would imagine how big of an influence he's had on your coaching style and career. Because I asked, you know, Caitlin talked about that she has a lot of Coach Kendrea in her and her style of coaching and things like that. And uh, uh, how much of that did you pick up during your playing days from Mike that you, you apply to your even today? Yeah, I think that um, he was so special in the fact that he let each of us be ourselves. Um, at Arizona, we got to be ourselves and he just tried to make us the best version of ourselves and, and help us get better and build confidence in, in us. And I think those are the two biggest keys as I kind of head into my further into my own coaching career was this the investment that he made in each and every one of us. You know, if you watch that Zoom and see, there's a relationship that he has that's different with every single player. But it, it's a relationship. It's not just a relationship with a team. It's not just a, a relationship with a decade. He has a personal relationship with all of those players that played for him. And so, you know, that's unique that he let us all be ourselves and, and really just focused on helping us be confident and buying into something bigger than ourselves. So, yeah, I, I don't think I get too much. Of course, I steal a ton of drills that we did, but I don't get too much into the specifics of those things. And I'm definitely not um, as big of a speaker as he is um, when he came to talking to the team and stuff like that. But as far as building confidence in my players and letting them be themselves and trying to help them be the best version of themselves through softball for life after softball, that's a huge thing that I really learned from him.
Yeah, I don't think many is as good a talker as he is. Uh, that might, yeah, so I don't think you're here alone in that. Uh, I mentioned you played with Caitlin and Taryn, uh, which is so wild. And I think you even told me you were roommates, right? You were roommates when you played. I mean, yep. how wild is it that the three of you have gone into coaching and having success? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's definitely a couple of people that I can pick up the phone and call if I have questions or want to gossip or anything like that. Um, to have those friendships and now still have a bond of being able to discuss coaching is pretty cool. Um, and then for them to be doing it for our, our, our alma mater is it's just amazing. Yeah, we all lived together. Um, Taryn's sophomore year and Caitlin and I's junior year and that was good times. That's a pretty fun. I don't even want to get into that because like you know we got our, we got our own student athletes now and we really just kind of got to go you know do as we uh, say not as we necessarily did except for when it comes to winning national championships. You guys can do that. Um, but you know it was a fun time. Uh, I think it shows just you know the kind of personalities that turn kind of cling together right we kind of all had the same passion and, and we connected through it even when we were players and we didn't necessarily know we were going to become coaches um we all really were students of the game and i think that that's why we had so much success you have an incredible career you're still 10th in the in all time at arizona 230 rbis you led the ncaa in rbis per game in 2005 you hit 48 home runs you were three-time first team all pack 10 performers they called it back then you were, uh, I mean, you two-time that. Describe, for those that didn't get to see you play, the type of player you, you were and how Christy Fox, the player, and Christy Fox, the coach, different, and how are they the same? Were they, if they, if they were both in the same room right now, how would that go? I don't know. I mean, I was pretty, I was pretty gritty. I definitely had a chip on my shoulder. Um, as a player, I felt like I got passed over in some things and um, I had some things to prove. You know, I was a 5'5 five, five player that, well, I think they listed me as 5'4, but I think I'm 5'5. Five, five. They, you know, a lot of coaches said, hey, you're not going to be a shortstop in college and, you know, you're little, you don't have a ton of power, you're going to hit here or there. And I, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder and um, really wanted to prove everybody that had ever, ever doubted me wrong. Um, so, you know, I, I tried to bring everybody along with me. I know my personality doesn't always match everybody else's. I think that that's the difference as a player, my tolerance for people that didn't have the same buy-in as I did. Um, I, I didn't have as much, whereas a coach now, I think it's really important that you find a way to connect with all of those around you and really find out what makes them tick, right? Instead of just what makes you tick. Um, so I would say as a player and as a coach that's probably the bigger biggest uh difference and i think that that just comes with maturity and growth and and really learning how to be a leader um, i do think i was a leader while i was there you know caitlin definitely got to be the lead by example and was perfect in every way but you know when somebody needed to be snapped into shape that's kind of where i came in i was a little bit more of the enforcer <laughs> and so i think now as i've grown up and matured I'm, I'm learning more about how to connect with people that maybe don't necessarily think the same way i do you know, we, you showed me here in your office, and for those that are watching our interview, can see that behind you there's the plaque. There are the national championship teams you were a part of. There you go. You're showing it. I like this. You're like a producer. Uh, there's your accolades right there. But I'm curious. Obviously, there's a bond. Obviously, when you're a part of a championship team, conference championship teams or national championship teams. I'm curious, do you show that to your players now? Do you show that plaque and tell them hey look at this is what it took to win this and we can accomplish these goals of winning the conference championships and and that's a, like a reminder if you will with the players even the normal times when they would see it or now even maybe you show them on virtual what is that like kind of a something you use when you talk uh, to your team currently now yeah definitely I think that um you know having been there and having done it um, and showing that when you do it a certain way and you work hard and, and you trust the process, here's what the result can be. Um, I definitely think that that helps them buy in. Um, we don't spend a ton of time on it. And I don't think Arizona spends a ton, a ton of time on it either. It's really about the process. And it's about life after softball. And these plaques to me right behind me are so much less about as I'm older now, right? It's less about winning the championship. It's so much more about 
the relationships that I've created with those women up there and the friendships that I've gained and just the feeling of being a part of something so much bigger than myself, not only just Arizona softball, but, you know, being an Arizona alumni and, and bleeding red and blue, if you will. I think that, you know, we talk more about that and, and the process and the friendships and what, what we're doing, what it's really about more so than we talk about results at all. You mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, the Mountain West. You didn't get to play it last season, obviously. Is, uh, how, is that significant? Not, I mean, you're all in the same boat, so it's not like one has an advantage over the other, but the fact that you didn't see the, the – you didn't play conference games. They didn't see some of your personnel. Uh, you didn't see some of the other team's personnel. Is that a big thing, not a big deal, uh, as you get pre in preparation for the 2021 season in the conference play? I think so. You know, I think there's a couple teams in the Mountain West in this past year that kind of changed a lot. You know, a couple of them are having really great early success that hadn't been having that the couple years before. And of course, you want to see, hey, where that's coming from. Um, you know, so, some other teams, you know, gaining some big pitchers, big name pitchers and what that looks like. And I just think that there's been a lot of change in the teams um, in our conference. And I think that the Mountain West is one of the most competitive conferences in terms of you don't know at the end of the day who can it could be anybody that ends up with that championship you know when you really do that preseason um you know seeing who's going to win and setting that it's hard you know it's hard it's not one of those ones where that one and two are just filled in every year and those, those two got to figure it out so I definitely think that there's a lot of comp um, competitive teams that are fighting for that spot and with us going into this year and just the craziness of COVID there's a chance that you know the automatic qualifier could be anybody well and we've discussed this when you've been on before obviously we the Mountain West how good the league is I, I've made it very public that I thought you you know you should have been in the NCAA tournament a couple years ago uh, but you're not the only one in the Mountain West that's dealt with that I remember I've had coach Newman on they dealt with this a few years back at San Diego State you, you've kind of the committee's kind of made it a two-bid league when in reality you probably should have been a three-bid league or a four-bid league and things like that is that something you all as coaches have talked about even now uh, as to make sure how to, you know, make sure get the word out about your league and how good your league is. Uh, because, you know, that's, a, that's something that I don't know if a lot of people that, you know, understand that because you got a lot of great talent there and taking it to that next step and make people aware, hey, we're, we're a strong league. We're as good as anybody. I know we had, I had Coach Lohman on recently. She got obviously the new head coach at San Jose State and she feels like, hey, we're, we're a P6 type of league. You know, it's not like just P5 and all that stuff. Where do you, what, what has that been like in the conversation? Because I'm sure all you coaches have talked about that from a Mountain West standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think our conference, you know, it is what it is. And I think that we have some very strong teams. And the only way we're going to continue to get other people to see that is what we're doing with our preseason. The difficult part is this year, that preseason is, is really outside of our control, more so than it ever has been before. You know, we're trying to schedule some Pac-12 teams and things like that to try to help with all that. But with everybody trying to come up with their COVID protocol and, and how you're going to go away, how you're going to do those visiting games, um, you know, and we all want to play as much of a full season as we possibly can, you know, the travel portion, you're doing more games of people closer to you than you ever had before. Um, and, the, and the schedule even to this point is constantly changing. So I hope that the committee and the people that are looking at this um, really realize that this year it's a little bit more out of the coach's control than ever before. And so they really go and look at those conference games and maybe watch some of those conference games because this league is very, very competitive. Agreed 100%. Eye test and, and watch the games and, and you know, observe talent. There's talent in this league. What, what, else is, what stands out to you this year in the league? Obviously, Fresno is good. Uh, they had a great year. They were having a great season last year. Boise State's been an NCAA tournament team in the last couple of years there. Uh, San Jose State's always been a tight contender. You know, I mean, what, what's your overall thoughts on the league as a whole in 2021? You know, I think that the biggest thing is staying healthy for all of us and making sure we can play as many games as we can. We're transitioning this year, hopefully only, into a doubleheader Saturday and a single game Sunday. So more so than ever before, making sure that your pitching staff is ready to go. Nobody in this league is going to be able to ride one arm um, throughout conference. So it's going to be very competitive. Um, across the board. And, and so I think it's going to be really about who stays healthy, 
and whose pitching staff can be deceiving. And I mean, I mean staff um, instead of just one. So, you know, that's kind of the piece. You got to come up with the, the one big hit and have a little luck on your side and create that luck on your own. But I think across the board is whoever can stay healthy and whoever's pitching staff can really be deceiving with the hitters is, is going to be the one that's um, we're looking at at the end of the year. Two last things. I know since we last spoke, uh, you got an NFL franchise, got to play a season in Las Vegas. I know you couldn't go to the games because they didn't allow fans for obvious reasons. But what was that like to have an NFL team now in, in the city in Las Vegas alongside the NHL team? Because uh, we've talked about that when you first, right, one of the things you, you, know, you liked and drew you to UNLV is the city. And, and now, obviously, I mean, and the pro teams, the pro sports are kind of following you, basically. Hey, let's yeah. go to Vegas. So I, I feel like you should take credit, number one, for the pro teams coming in because you've started that trend. But number two, what, did that, what was that like as someone now as a, as a resident? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're really trying to make this a sports capital and bring in strong teams and, and really invest in their athletics. And it's been really cool to see across, you know, our city, the different symbols. And, you know, you see the Raiders and you see the Golden Knights and then you see UNLV right there with them. You know, the community is really buying into athletics across the board. Now, I didn't get to go to a Raider game. However, the UNLV football team does play in Raider Stadium. And wow. early on early on we got to have fans and there were limited fans so I actually got to go twice to two different UNLV football games and go inside of Raider Stadium and actually see it and get to experience it and it's absolutely amazing and it's wonderful and I think that when we do open up and we do get to have fans it's going to be a huge selling point um, for us both recruiting and just people moving here and wanting to be a part of what Vegas is building. That's amazing. I didn't realize that. I've forgotten about that, that UNLV did play there. What was it like to be in that venue? Because obviously you're one of the few people that could say you've been in there. I mean, it looks tremendous on TV from what I saw. How does it look in person? It's so sleek. It's clean. It's very um, technology based everywhere you go. You know, obviously every single thing wasn't open because we only had very limited fans. But from what I saw, it was a first class production um, from the security to the support to the parking. It's just everybody has really raised the bar when it comes to just um, serving the community. It, it's awesome. All right. Well, I remember you invited me to come up to Vegas when uh, you first came on the podcast. I still hope that offer still stands. So when we ever get back to kind of normal, I pick you up on that. And now you're going to have to hook me up to Raider games or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Me and you both, man. Those tickets <laughs> are expensive. Okay, I'll start, I'll start working on it now. <laughs> <laughs> a little high demand. I get it. A little hot demand. I know. I, I, see, I, didn't even, I thought hockey was going to be the harder ticket. But it sounds like both are going to be hard tickets, huh? Both are tough. I've only been to one nice game, too. It's tough, but it's amazing. That's why. Have you now become – are you now a Raider fan and, 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 and Golden Knights fan, or you still have other allegiances you've stuck with? Um, you know, football has never been – NFL football has never been something that I've been super into, so I, I'll refrain from that. I will say that my husband is a huge Dallas Star fan from when right. we were oh. at UTA, so he is stuck with the Stars. But I will definitely say my allegiance has uh, moved to the Golden Knights. Does that mean he is he a Cowboy fan or is he does he have an NFL allegiance? Seahawks. He's from he's from uh, Washington, Seattle. So okay. He, All right. He's Seahawks. I'm neutral on football. And oh, that's the best got... though. That's the best. You don't have you don't have to up and down emotions. You can just enjoy the the, the sport. And I can enjoy my Sunday and not exactly. have to sit in front of the TV all day. <laughs> That's true. Trust. That's probably a positive. Uh, last thing before I let you go. Obviously, once you step on the field, as far as things you can control, what's going to be the keys for your team to accomplish all the internal goals you'll have? You know, I think that just things that we've always said, control what you can control. Know that adversity is going to be coming our way no matter what. I think that as coaches, we really have to invest in all of our student athletes. I know we all do, but I'm one of those coaches that usually once my nine are set, I'm pretty solid on those nine being the ones on the field. I think this year more than ever in the preseason, I got to make sure that I get everybody some time and some opportunities because you never know who could test positive and, and you know, have a contact trace and, and be missing for a period of time. And you still need to be successful, especially once you get into conference. So making sure that across the lineup, they all are prepared and have opportunities early on so that when their name's called later on, um, they're ready to go. That's UNLV head coach Christy Fox here on In the Circle. Uh, coach, thanks again uh, for joining us. I know it's busy as you're getting set 
for the start of the season. I appreciate the, 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 the tour of the office there, but uh, appreciate you joining us. And congrats again. I know it's another honor uh, to be part of that old deck 18 too. It was cool to see you kind of, you know, reunite with a lot of your teammates and things like that. And uh, it's been fun to see that and fun to see what you've been building at UNLV, like I said, and winning. And so I'll be wishing you luck and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much.